Tony Elliott uh, looking to build Virginia football from the ground up, entering his third season and, in a sense, his third recruiting class. We've got uh, Jackie Franchuli on the line from 247 Sports. You can join her on Wahoos 247 as she breaks down the recruiting class in depth there and everything involving Virginia football and basketball. Jackie, I know you're not doing so well this morning. We appreciate you stopping by. Hope you're going to do better uh, later today, but thank you so much for um, showing up to break down the class for us. Yeah, no, no problem. Yeah, this is the, the normal uh, end of season cold that I always seem to get. Well, let's look at this class. So 67th rated, you know, this is the type program that certainly I don't think that the ranking is that much of a indication of necessarily the class and that's why we've got you here do you think it addressed needs and they were able to find some possible gems out there yeah i, I think that's accurate what you said about the rankings that really represent what Tony Elliott and the staff was able to do specifically because they attacked the portal for some of the needs that they needed immediately um, I think they were able to get a few guys in the in the high school ranks that will help them add depth um, I know they're very excited about a lot of their D linemen they were able to get, like Jewett Hayes and uh, Chase Morrison and Tyler Simmons. I think there were three guys that they could add some good depth in that class uh, moving forward. But I think they also picked up some good talented players in state, like John Rogers, who UVA. Um, first, a lot of college coaches, from what I could gather, didn't know where to offer. So, but John Rogers. Uh, Virginia saw as a potential at tight end, and he's the highest ranked recruit in the class. Uh, so I think he was kind of a guy that probably would have gotten more offers if he didn't commit so early. Virginia was the first big offer, and he committed on the spot. Um, I th think Kev Courtney flipping him towards the end of you know the cycle, like on Tuesday he announced the day before early signing day. He's also a good guy, very talented from a very story program. So getting your kind of getting a presence at Freedom High School is very good for Virginia as well. So again, a lot of good things in that high school class alone. And also just kind of doing connections in the Connecticut and the Northeast, where there's a lot of prep schools where Virginia can have some successes like Tristan Ward, Keyshawn Adams. Those are two really good players. And you're seeing playing dividends because they already picked up a 2025 commitment in Cole Gear. So you're establishing those pipelines that you want. So a lot of good things from this class um, the trenches picked up three linemen, but for Virginia, it was really about what they got in the transfer portal. They got Chris Tyree, a Notre Dame wide receiver that could have instant impact, kind of fill the hole that Malik Washington just left. Also Tyler Neville, Harvard tight end. I uh, had offers from like UCLA, South Carolina, very highly sought after tight end, good pass catcher, certainly add so another weapon for Anthony Caladrea or Tony Muskin in the air. And, and when you look at what they also did, they also added uh, Corey Thomas on the defensive side of the ball. He's a hybrid linebacker safety type, so kind of fits that John Radzinski role that they wanted, filling the hole that Lex Long left after he entered the portal. Um, and then finally, Kendrick Smith added depth at the secondary. So they're, they're making progress in the holes. Like if you look at their scholarship chart and where they needed holes, you're seeing them kind of attack those. So yeah, the ranking 67 in high school, but the transfer ranking, ranking is going to get higher. Uh, Kendrick Smith is still unranked on 24-7. He's going to get ranked. I expect him to add another player in the next few days. So I, I think when you look at the overall picture, it was definitely improvement and progress from what we saw last year. Chris Tyree was an addition that uh, definitely gained some national attention. He's the most well-known of any of these guys coming in from Notre Dame. Uh, didn't necessarily fulfill his promise there, but showed some flashes and they were counting on him as being a breakthrough game changing kind of player. So hopefully he can find that uh, at Virginia. Uh, Jackie, uh, as you look at Tony Elliott's approach and you mentioned him going in different directions and then just focusing on Virginia in particular, I see two top 20 players from the state at the top of the board. Uh, Virginia in a difficult position in a number of ways. Of course, high academic standards. Also, Penn State infiltrates. They're in this location where, yes, Penn State, Maryland from the Big Ten, you've got Tennessee makes Virginia a target. Uh, the Carolina schools come 
uh, from the South uh, to infiltrate Virginia. What is Tony Elliott selling? Where, where do you think he has a path to sell the Virginia brand? Yeah, well, first thing is that Virginia has improved their NIL game. I think that was one of the things that struggled a little bit last year. And I think in the NIL space, they've, they've started to get better. Um, I think also having guys like Cam Robinson, a, a top four star last year that showed that he could play as a freshman at Virginia and be one of their best players and be named in all American teams definitely helps because if you're a young guy in the state of Virginia, you can be buried in the depth chart at Penn State or Tennessee, or you can come to Virginia and perform and still get national accolades. So I think that's the angle that Tony Elliott is using. I think having Anthony Colandrea and Cam Robinson perform well during their first year has certainly helped UVA out of the recruiting trail. I mean, I, I've talked to a few receivers. I mean, Isaiah Robinson, which is probably a four-star on a, whenever he is ranked on a 2020-25 class, he committed to Virginia, and he first thing he mentioned was Malik Washington and his performance. He also mentioned that Anthony Colandre is a young quarterback. He was going to be there for a while. He's also saying, like, hey, these guys are freshmen, and they are on the field ahead of guys that have been there for a few years. So they're like, if, you're, if I come in there and perform well as a freshman and practice, I can get it on the field. So they're doing it by doing – it's always that whole thing, right? You perform on the field. You you show – that your words mean something. So so that's the sort of thing that Tony Elliott and his staff need to do. It's still going to be an uphill battle because, like you said, there are things in the way. I mean, in, transfer, in the transfer market, I mean, Virginia has some additional things that they need to worry about. It's not just about GPA or grades. It's about which credits align. And Virginia's majoring offer is so different than other schools. So a lot of credits don't align, which means you have problems with eligibility. So there are still those hurdles. But if you're Virginia... What you want is you want to be a developmental program. You want to use your transfer portal to kind of get in and fill those holes for, you know, get, get, get like Brian Stevens, who did really well last year as Virginia Center. Grab guys like Chris Tyree, grab guys like Malik Washington to fill those holes. But you want to be a developmental program and you want to show that you can develop them. And that's what they're doing. So this year, they have to show that they made progress one more year. Don't forget that this is Virginia's first full off season. I mean, the first year Tony Elliott came, he came in late in the process. He didn't have a coaching staff. His first class was basically Bronco Mendenhall's last class. And then the second year, he had a tragedy on campus, which saw three of his players killed. And then a week or two later, his staff was had to be on the road, and they were in people's homes with parents asking, can you keep my kids mm -hmm. safe while they were still in mourning? So this is really the first chance for this staff to really have a – full recruiting cycle, a, a normal off season. So this is where you start seeing what's next for Virginia. I'm looking at the schedule and I caught several of these games. And before I mentioned those, you did um, allude to Malik Washington's season. And I was aware of him, aware of him putting up big numbers, but it didn't really hit me how big those numbers were until I was doing some research regarding uh, postseason awards. And it was just like, I, so I think a lot of people listening that are national college football fans that don't uh, follow Virginia on a regular basis, go look up Malik Washington's numbers at one of the outstanding seasons in college football. But I think uh, Jackie on that night that uh, in Chapel Hill, uh, college football nation wasn't really paying much attention to that game until like midway through the fourth quarter. And then a lot of us checked it out uh, the first, the the last couple drives of the game when Virginia pulled out a big win against North Carolina, and I watched the game start to finish against Louisville. That was a a game that uh, could have been won easily. Uh, you know, there was a big letdown there against Virginia Tech to finish out the season, but a lot of close losses against some pretty quality competition. Of course, Miami in overtime. So this this team is is close, and the the quarterback situation kind of flipped this year in regards to showing us what Virginia may have in store in the future. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, it's nice to have two quarterbacks that could go and lead an offense, right? I mean, yeah. Tony Musket was hurt in the opening game of the season, and then a freshman came in. Uh, it was a struggle in the beginning, but then when Tony Musket was hurt again, Anthony Colandrea came in and showed his potential and what he could be in the future. He's showing progress, development. Those are key things for a developmental program. That's what you want to show recruits. are like, look at Anthony Colandrea. And even in the loss against Virginia Tech, you can't put too much on Colandria in that loss. I mean, if you look at that tape, it, it wasn't Colandria's fault. There was a lot of things that went wrong. And in this Virginia team, the margin of error is so small. 
So when you look at what they have on the field, I mean, special teams has been a, a glaring thing that you've noticed. They've cost Virginia game. I mean, you could argue that if it wasn't for special teams, they might have beat Louisville because um, they had that block punt for a touchdown. I mean, so, and I think they've had two of those this year with the most in the nation. So I, I think when you look at Virginia, there are, and they, they would have beat JB as well. So there were so many oper missed opportunities for this team. And I know a lot of it had to do with injuries too. If you look at Virginia's defense, I mean, their best pass rusher, Cam Butler, who is now getting their, his third year at Virginia after coming in with one year eligibility, he was able to get two more. He's back next year. Um, he was out hurt after the third game, but he was, he had about three and a half sacks in four games. And that was a huge loss for them. He was out. Chico Bennett missed a few games and was hurt for most of the year. Ben Smiley missed a few games because of concussion protocol. And the secondary never had Antonio Clary, which would have, which would have been one of the veteran leaders in that secondary. I mean, DeAndre Walker, who had his first interception in his career against Boston College, got hurt in that celebration and then was missed a few games. So you had a lot of injuries on this team, especially on the defensive side. So for them to keep those close games as, as close as they were and have opportunities to win, says that this team is moving in the right direction. The only thing that this staff needs to do is to make sure that they do fill those holes so they're not in this position next year. You don't want to be in a position where you don't have playable depth. That's what this team didn't have. They didn't have playable depth. They, you know what? They didn't probably don't want to put Caleb Hardy, a freshman safety out there so early. They they probably wanted to have give him time for development, but they just didn't have that. I mean, Mikai Buchanan, a freshman DN, was playing. Jason Hammond, a freshman D tackle, was playing. These guys probably would have benefited for a redshirt season, but they just didn't have that opportunity. Um, they also, during the O-line, I mean, they probably had maybe five guys that they were confident in the O-line, maybe six or seven. And in the last game against Virginia Tech, you had a flu take over most of that um, O-line, and they were still playing. So that is certainly a big thing for them. Jackie Franchuli joining us from Wahoos 247 Sports. Uh, check out Jackie's work again, Wahoos 247. Uh, Jackie, thank you so much for stopping by, breaking down National Signing Day for us and uh, these five transfers. I uh, hope you feel better. Have a great Christmas and a happy new year as well. Thanks for having me and you too.